Cyber Talk fans, today is another episode of Bottomless Test Questions Review. Just like before, give me a star for each correct answer and fire for each incorrect answer. Without further ado, let's get into it. Number 1. When collecting blood samples in evacuated tubes that contain sodium citrate or ACD, the ratios of blood to additives must be A. 10 to 1 B. 9 to 1, C, 8 to 2, or D, 7 to 3? The answer is B, 9 to 1 ratio. What top tube color contains sodium citrate? Yes, the blue top tube is the one that contains sodium citrate. Do you know what ACD stands for? Acid citrate dextrose, which is the yellow top tube. When drawing these two tubes, you must draw to the fill line, but be careful to not overfill it either. The ratios must be 9 to 1. Underfilling the tubes may lead to Foley's prolonged test results. Overfilling the tube may result in false low results, or the specimens may clot or contain fibrin due to inadequate anticoagulants for the blood volumes drawn which is results in specimen rejection. Number two, if the phlebotomist is accidentally splashed with a high toxic hazardous chemical, what is the minimum length of time that the affected part should be flooded with water? Two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, or 15 minutes? The answer is D, 15 minutes. This is true for splashes on the body or in the eyes. We should know the locations of the shower, eye wash stations, and the SDS locations in your area. Once you finish flushing the part that got exposed, follow up with the employee health or emergency rooms as soon as possible and notifying your supervisor. Be mindful of your surroundings. If you see your friends using the eye wash stations, help them out. You could notify the supervisor, get the wheelchair to help transport, or look up the SDS for your friends. Number three, the primary focus of CLEAR 1988 is to ensure that A. Patients get correct laboratory results. B. Patients are reimbursed for errors. C. Patients are informed of rights. Or D. Patients are protected from injury. The answer is A. The primary focus of CLEAR 1988 is to ensure that the patients get correct laboratory results by requiring that the laboratory meets quality standards. The laboratories are required to be certified by state authorities and by CMS or Central for Medicare and Medical Service. The three agencies that are responsible for CLEARs are 1. FDA, Food and Drug Administrator, categorize tests and develop rules. 2. CMS, issue certificates, inspect, publishes rules, and monitor lab performance. 3. CDC, provide research, develop information, and manage the advisory committee. You should know that laboratory is heavily regulated by accredited agency, following the rules and regulations, as well as keeping yourselves updated with the new regulations are good qualities for laboratory personnel. Number four. At which of the following times are peak levels of cortisol usually obtained? A. In the late afternoon. B. Around noon. C. In the early morning. Or D. At midnight. The answer is C. Cortisol levels is peak in the early morning. The lowest level is usually around midnight. Exercise increased cortisol level. Because of these variations, multiple tests of cortisol levels are often done, such as at 8 a.m. and at 4 p.m. to evaluate the change in the level. 
The total cortisol levels, which is obtained within 24 hours urine, does not show the variations because when you collect the 24-hour urines, it's all contained in one container, regardless of what time of the day that you collect it in. Number five, which of the following is the appropriate level of isolations for patients with influenza? Droplets, contact, airborne, or standard? The answer is A, droplet. The different types of isolations are used under different circumstances, but it is there to prevent transmissions of infectious disease. The CDC identified two main categories of precautions, standard precautions and transmissions-based precautions. The standard precautions are just what the name suggests. It is a basic standard practice precautions for all patients. The standard precautions. These precautions are followed by medical staff, which care for all patients, even those with no known infection disease. Standard infection control precautions include hand washing or sanitize upon entering and leaving the patient's room. Personal protective equipment or PPE such as gloves, mask, safety glass, gowns, aprons, or shoes cover may be used when exposed to body fluids such as blood, saliva, or urine if possible or if open wounds are present. The transmissions-based precautions are needed when an infection disease is suspected or diagnosed. There are three types of transmissions-based precautions, contact isolations, droplet isolations, and airborne isolations. Contact isolation is used when a patient has an infectious disease that may be spread by touching either the patient or other objects that the patient has handled. Contact precautions usually require medical staff and visitors to wear gown and gloves when entering the patient rooms. Examples of contact isolations are MRSA, C. diff, and novel virus. Droplet isolation. Droplet isolation is used when a patient has an infection such as respiratory infections that may be spread through sneezing or coughing. PPE for droplet precautions such as surgical mask, goggles, or face chill are required when entering the patient room. They help prevent contact with nasal or lung secretions containing the infection's agents. Examples of illness that would be classified as droplet isolations are influenza, pertussis or woofing cough, and mumps. Airborne isolation is the strictest level of isolation. Airborne isolation is needed when disease-causing agents can float in the air and be breathed in by surrounding people. Patients under airborne isolations are typically placed in isolated room called negative pressure rooms, which the air is removed through a separate filter system and not allowed to flow into other space. A closed door is typically required for airborne isolations. The required PPE are gloves, goggle, gown, hairnet, and shoe cover. Medical staff generally wear specialized respirator masks when they enter airborne isolation rooms. Visitors are often limited during airborne isolations. The example of airborne isolations are chickenpox, measles, and tuberculosis. That's all I have for today. Did I miss anything? If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm more than happy to answer them. If I don't know, I will try my best to find out for you. Also, keep in mind that the information I put together here is the general practice at the moment. As time change, certain practice may change and different institutions may have different policies. So please keep an eye out for that. 
If you like my video and think it's helpful in any way, please share it with your friends, and I shall see you all next time. As always, remember, your blood tells you the story of your health. Thanks for watching. Bye.